Hello, and thank you for joining us today in this historic day. Welcome to our virtual rally to celebrate the reintroduction of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, the most comprehensive, practical, and pragmatic bill ever introduced in Congress to address the plastic pollution crisis. During the current international pandemic and beyond, this federal bill, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, will measurably reduce the toxic exposure of a material which is a threat to all living things. A toxic threat caused by the extraction, production, manufacture, exposure to, and incineration of single-use plastics, which suffocates life and threatens the environment by contributing to climate change. Plastic never was, never will be disposable, and neither are we. This is a plastic pollution prevention bill. We are working with Congress on bipartisan solutions for a plastic pollution-free America to measurably reduce plastic pollution and waste as we all work together towards a more just world free of plastic pollution. My name is Jackie Nunez and I'm the founder of The Last Plastic Straw and I'm the advocacy program manager at Plastic Pollution Coalition, two of the member organizations in the Break Free from Plastic movement. And I'd like to introduce my colleagues and friends, Caro Gonzalez and Melissa Aguayo, who coordinate the Break Free from Plastic member organizations in the, in the US and will be moderating today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a movement working together on finding solutions to plastic pollution, we are excited to spend the next hour and a half with you all. Así es, Caro. Gracias a todos por participar en este evento. A few logistics before we get started. Spanish interpretation is available for today's event via phone. Please call the number on the screen to hear the Spanish language interpretation. The interpreted event will be made available on the Break Free from Plastic YouTube channel in the next several days. El evento de hoy tiene interpretación al español. Por favor, llame al número 1-669-900-6833 y luego de la instrucción en inglés, marque el código 879-279-7848 numeral para continuar y escuchar la interpretación y silenciar el YouTube. El video de este evento con interpretación será publicado en la cuenta de Break Free from Plastic en unos días. On this slide are the speakers for today. Thanks, Melissa. Today, you will hear directly from legislators and experts about the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Here are three ways in which you can support this legislation. You can ask your legislators to co-sponsor the bill. You can ask your organization to endorse the bill and help amplify on social media. Visit breakfreefromplastic.org slash pollution dash act to learn more. Thanks, Caro. Now it is my honor to introduce Councilwoman Casey Camp Hornick, Councilwoman and Hereditary Drumkeeper of the Ponca Tribe of Oklahoma, who will offer a reflection on the importance of our work today, grounded in her ancestral tradition and a blessing for our success. In her role as the Environmental Ambassador for the Ponca Tribe of Oklahoma, Casey led the effort to become one of the first tribes in the country to enact a rights of nature law and pass a fracking moratorium on their territory. Without further ado, Councilwoman Casey Camp Hornick. Thank you. My traditional name is Juzi. My colonized name is Casey Camp Hornick. I'm also the environmental ambassador for the Ponca Nation of Oklahoma. Coming here today with a very excited feeling inside my heart, and I want to offer a good thought to all of you. The prayers for this day have been laid down by our ancestors, by your ancestors. We all live on this Mother Earth. Hi, everyone. I think we're having some audio issues with um, Casey's connection but we wanna thank her for grounding us in the importance of this work. Uh, now, please allow me to introduce Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon. In the 12 years he's been in office, Senator Merkley has been a longtime climate and environmental champion. As he enters his third term, one of his top priorities is breaking the cycle of plastic pollution and getting the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act signed into law. He will be in a prime position to lead on this bill as a lead sponsor in the Senate and as the chair of a key subcommittee that will oversee this bill in the Senate. Welcome, Senator Merkley. 
much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes Senator, can. we can hear you okay. Okay, terrific. Well, I'm Senator Jeff Merkley, and we are here today because we are facing a real crisis, a crisis of plastic pollution. And plastic pollution is more than just seeing an ugly mountain of single-use plastics when you go to the beach or you're on the riverbank. Plastics are poisoning our bodies through the air we breathe, through the water we drink, through the food we eat. In fact, each of us on average is ingesting a credit card size amount of microplastics every week. And so just pull out a credit card out of your pocket and think, do I wanna eat one of these every week? Think about all the toxic chemicals that are embedded in that plastic, endocrine disruptors, things that affect our reproductive health system can't be good for our health and our children's health, our, our loved one's health, our community's health. So we need to address that. And a lot of people are surprised. They think there's no problem because they see those blue bins and they were taught the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. And they say, well, we're, you know, we're throwing things into the recycling bin. Doesn't that solve the problem? And the answer is no, it does not. And because very little that goes into the blue bins actually gets recycled and a whole lot doesn't go into them to begin with. The reality is more like the three B's than the three R's, three B's, it's buried, the plastic is burned, the plastic is borne out to sea. The truth is that we are doing way too little to address this major threat to our health and to the environment. Waste is spiraling out of control. So that's why we're here today. We have to recognize that so much ends up in landfills, so much ends up in oceans, so much is burned. And when it's burned, it unleashes a lot of fumes that do more damage to us. And when it floats out to sea, it wreaks havoc on wildlife. Our marine life likes those little colorful things and thinks they're food. They've never seen this over millions of years. They snatch it up, it fills up their gut, they die, and then the microplastics are having an impact as, as well. Uh, so we have to take this on. And that's what this act is all about. And I can tell you that the impacts of producing plastic are another important piece of the puzzle. They are generally produced in areas that are on our frontline urban communities, particular impact on our, our low income communities, our black and brown communities. They're on the front line. And so we need to make sure that we address every facet of this challenge, which is what this bill does. And to get any bill passed, you have to have an inside force working on it. And that's what I'm working to do to get maximum opportunity to hold hearings on this as chair of the relevant subcommittee. And we have to have an outside force making it an issue and educating people and creating pressure and telling their House and Senate members, you've got to get involved in this. This has been ignored for way too long. This bill has a practical common sense blueprint for taking on the challenge of plastics. It's made up of components that are already in place in cities, in states, in communities across America. So it's not like we're suggesting things that have never been tried. One thing the bill does is ban a set of non-recyclable single-use plastic products. Another thing it does is create a national bottle bill, like the one we've been using in, in Oregon for 50 years to incentivize more recycling. And it's recognition that we have to have the producers more involved, the corporations to do their part. And that means a temporary pause on construction of new plastic and petrochemical production facilities. We ensure safeguards in place before they're built to protect fence line communities and frontline communities from the impact. And it means that these same corporations take responsibility for the impact of their products and set up operations to help facilitate robust recycling. Think a little bit like the printer cartridges that we have in printers and the easy way that you can recycle those. So through all these various efforts, we have to push forward fiercely. It's not like the status quo operations are just gonna say, okay, we're with you. No, they have to be educated, they have to be pushed. And that's what this is all about. It's what this kickoff is all about. We have to unleash the same American ingenuity in solving the problem as the ingenuity that created all these uses for plastic in the first place. We have a president who believes in protecting our planet. We have a congressional majority 
committed to taking on environmental justice issues. So this is a great moment. Let's get to work and make this year, 2021, the year that we pass this bill and break our dangerous addiction to plastic. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. In addition to championing this bill, you're leading efforts on democracy reform and the For the People Act. Could you please elaborate on how these two priorities are related? You know, I think about how our whole government uh, is around the philosophy not of having uh, edicts from kings and queens, but from the power of the people through the ballot box. And that's the essence of the we the people, the first three words of our, our Constitution. It's the essence of why Lincoln at Gettysburg talked about government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, we the people want to take on plastic pollution. We the people don't want a credit card's worth of plastic in our food and air and water every single week. Uh, we the people want environmental justice. And who's opposed? Well, it's the powerful, not the people. So we need the For the People Act, which takes on corruption of the vision of our government. Oh, we have all these voter suppression tactics blocking the ballot box. We need to protect the ballot box for every single American. We have gerrymandering that is designed to bias our government in favor of the power for the people. Let's end that gerrymandering. We have dark money. If you and I make a donation to a campaign, it's public information who made the donation. But if a very rich multimillionaire donates a few million dollars, they don't have to disclose who they are. That is outrageous, and we need to end it. That dark money is corrupting and polluting our campaign system. So the For the People Act is essential to have a government that will actually reflect the vision of government of, by, and for the people. So we've got to get that bill passed this year. Thank you so much, Senator Merkley. And now I'd like to introduce Representative Alan Lowenthal. Congressman Lowenthal is the sponsor of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of 2021 in the House of Representatives, in addition to sponsoring the original bill in the 116th US Congress of 2020. He has been a champion of the movement to break free from plastic pollution for many years. Welcome, Representative Lowenthal. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank everybody for joining us today. I'm so excited, but I'm also would like to say I'm very proud to join with my friends and colleagues. I know Senator uh, Merkley, who we've just heard from, and also Representative Clark, who will follow me, to as we reintroduce what you've already heard is the most comprehensive pla uh, plastic uh, waste legislation ever introduced, which is called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. This bill incorporates the best practices and important common sense policies and is a roadmap to meaningfully tackling this crisis. While it may be ambitious, it is by no means a radical approach. These policies are already being implemented by many cities, many states, and in other countries. The legislation ensures that our communities are protected from the health and the environmental impacts of plastic production and the pollution that results from plastic production and the waste that results from plastic production. And our communities are, and, our min, and especially our municipalities, are no longer burdened with having to foot the bill for cleanup and for disposal. By requiring that the producers are responsible for the end use of their own products by incorporating minimum recycled content standards and by investing in our domestic recycling infrastructure, we are going to be creating a structure and incentive to build better products and to close the loopholes for a circular economy. 
But this legislation didn't just appear in Congress. It was due in large part to the hard work and to the dedication of advocates like all those who are watching and for each of you on this, on this show. You know, for far too long, Washington has ignored this crisis and, the, and has closed its eyes to the impacts of plastic pollution and production on frontline and fenceline communities, requiring that advocates like all of you, as well as the states and local governments step up. And that's exactly what you did. But I am here to tell you that from here on, Congress is stepping up with you to break free from plastic pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lowenthal. Could you share how the 2021 bill expands and builds upon the work that happened in the first version of the bill, like the inclusion of language justice, which ensures that impacted communities have access to critical information in the language they best understand? Well, thank you for asking it. As you pointed out, most of the updates expand or add to provisions in, from the bill that was introduced last Congress, but there's some critical additions to the bill. And one of them is has to do with how we strengthen the environmental justice provision. As was pointed out already, frontline and fence line communities are the most impacted but, and, but we had to strengthen the bill to protect those communities and to have them have greater input upon the impact by including professional language interpretation and translation for all, uh, translation services for all the times that we're gonna have public comment on plastic pollution and all the materials have to be translated uh, into the languages uh, of those communities when there is a significant non-English speaking population. This is imperative if the people that are most impacted really begin to have a say uh, on, on the pollution that comes to them. And it's especially true, as we know, for communities of color and immigrant communities, which are, uh, which are the most impacted by by, uh, the by the pollution that we see. But I really want to raise another. We've learned a lot since we first introduced the bill. And another uh, provision, which we didn't spell out in the last Congress, addresses microfiber pollution. The pollution that comes off your clothes, the plastics that are there, the microfibers. And so what we've done is mandate filters on washing machines uh, and a competitive grant program to begin to fund research on the best practices for upstream microfiber pollution uh, prevention. We've got to prevent the, uh, the release of microfibers that, that we have found. So we also have increased the numbers of toxic chemicals that we use uh, in plastic production. Uh, that much more so than when we first covered and we, we, where we targeted mostly PFAS. But now we've in, increased the number of toxic chemicals that we are now going to prohibit in the, in the production, again, to protect those that are most vulnerable and communities out there. Uh, we've done some, a few other things. We've uh, updated the recycling content standards to be a more, with a more aggressive timeline, uh, requiring a much higher amount of recycled material. And as we all know that recently, uh, uh, we do not recycle. And even though we see some symbols that say, uh, that uh, this, this, this plastic is going to be recycled very, very small percentage, and there's no requirements to recycle. Well, we have an aggressive time frame in the bill where we require greater and greater amounts over time that any plastic have more and more recycled material. So those are just some of the things that we've done to take an already comprehensive bill and make it more responsive to the people that are impacted by pollution. 
Thank you, Representative Lowenthal. Now let me introduce you to Representative Katherine Clark from Massachusetts. Her career in public service is driven by her commitment to helping children and families succeed. She's a vocal advocate for ending wage discrimination, protecting women's health, access to affordable, high quality childcare, paid family leave, and other reforms. Welcome, Representative Clark. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Senator Merkley, Congressman Lowenthal, and our incredible partner organizations, including the entire Plastic Pollution Coalition. I am thrilled to be here today as we reintroduce the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. We know Climate change is the defining issue of our time and our only path forward to a clean, sustainable future is urgent, bold action. And this bill is our roadmap. It will allow us to turn the tide on waste production and ultimately on the climate crisis itself. We know plastics are one of the leading contributors to carbon dioxide production in the world. The United States disposes of or incinerates an estimated 32 million tons of plastic each year. And globally, we produce over 350 million tons of plastic, and that volume is increasing annually. By 2050, global plastic production is projected to triple and will account for 20% of all fossil fuel consumption. This act reigns in waste by reducing single-use plastics, improving recycling, decreasing harmful emissions, and ensuring that plastics don't continue to wind up in our water, soil, air, and even our bodies. This bill is about our future, but also an answer to the persistent inequities of today. The toxic impact of plastic production and disposal disproportionately harms low-income people and communities of color. Further, we stop the harmful practice of shipping our waste to developing countries, which only creates public health hazards abroad in the process. Environmental sustainability is our promise. Climate justice is our goal. Today, we begin the process of breaking free from plastics and harmful waste. Together, we will break old systems of oppression by moving ourselves toward a cleaner and more just country and world. I look forward to working with everyone to get this bill to the White House to be signed by the president. And I'm so grateful to everyone on this call for their partnership and advocacy. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Representative Clark. Now we would like to share a recorded statement by Representative Steve Cohen from Tennessee about why he is supporting the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Thank you, I'm Congressman Steve Cohen and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. I've, I've been fighting against this plastic uh, problem we've got in America, and it's been put on us by the oil industry now because that's the way they're going to make their monies. Um, we've got one planet, and we need to take care of it. Uh, despite the good intentions of many of us who separate uh, our, our trash and have a recycle bin for recyclables than the others, uh, too much of it, it ends up being put uh, in, in incinerators and, and gets shipped overseas for another country to deal with our or they end up in landfills. It's just it's the system we've got right now is not working real well. It's good what we're doing to try to separate, uh, but it, it's not being implemented well. And the Break Free from Plastic Coalition create new standards that will make it easier for consumers to, to, to help the, the earth, to help the environment in recycling and limit amount of, the amount of material that ends up in landfills and gets burned up. So from clear labels about what is recyclable to limiting the use of, of polyester, polyesterine, this bold comprehensive bill would make a substantial difference in limiting plastics consumption and furthering recycling efforts. And we need that. We need to make it simple. Uh, we need to overhaul the recycling system of our country and break free from plastic coalition act. will do that. Uh, I'm honored to work with Congressman Alan Lowenthal and Senator Merkley uh, for the, and appreciate their leadership on this issue. And I'm happy to be a co-sponsor of the bill. Let's break free from, from plastic pollution, and save our planet. 
A big thank you to Congress members Merkley, Lowenthal, Clark, and Cohen for your continued leadership on this issue. We are so grateful to have such strong allies in Congress leading the fight to break free from plastic pollution. We know you have a lot of important work to get back to, so we will now continue with our program. Next, we would like to share a video from actress and activist Rosario Dawson, who couldn't join us today, but would like to share a few words about the importance of addressing the plastic pollution crisis. Hi, I'm Rosario Dawson, and as a proud member of Plastic Pollution Coalition, I am so excited for a new day for America and our climate future. Now, I'm here to talk about the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of 2021, which builds on the success of statewide laws from across the country and outlines practical plastic reduction strategies to realize a healthier, more sustainable, just and equitable future for all Americans. This is an opportunity to help America shift away from a throwaway plastic culture and embrace reuse by regulating big oil in the petrochemical industry, incentivizing innovation, and protecting our oceans, waterways, and vulnerable communities from our man-made plastic pandemic. Who could have imagined that the packaging from all these wonderful products with all their conveniences would come back to haunt us and harm us so profoundly? But that's the inconvenient truth. The health of our climate, our oceans, our lives is caught up in plastic and it's choking our life support system. Our insatiable demand for single use has turned into environmental abuse on a global scale. Our oceans have become a plastic soup. Microplastics have been found in our food, our water, and even in our bodies and the air we breathe. Right now, the petrochemical industry is expanding U.S. plastic production, contributing to increased air pollution and global warming. From extraction to production to disposal, every step of this increased production contributes to the plastic pollution, which is filling our oceans, landfills, and landscapes. The fact is, we'll never meet our goals to curb climate change causing greenhouse gas emissions unless we curb our appetite for single-use plastic and adopt a mindset that encourages us to rethink our consumption and reuse what we create. Plastic pollution is an environmental issue, but it's also a social justice issue, one which disproportionately impacts black and brown, indigenous and frontline communities across the US and around the world. Social and environmental justice are intertwined and we need our government to step up to stop choking our communities and killing our planet. I am proud to support this collaboration and the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, supported by more than 1,800 groups to accelerate meaningful progress on all fronts and move beyond successful efforts to simply ban plastic bags, bottles, straws, and foodware. Now, those admirable efforts won't be enough if we keep making mountains of new plastic. We must head it off upstream at the source. We can make this a decade of renewal restore common sense and realize the vision of a plastic pollution-free America with the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Join us, contact your members of Congress today to urge their support of this vital, historic, groundbreaking legislation. Together, we can do this. Thank you for caring and making a difference. We're gonna move on with uh, one of our first uh, feature speakers for today. Um, so we would like to uh, welcome Miyoko Sakashita, Ocean Director with Center for Biological Diversity, uh, who's going to be speaking about the systemic damage that plastic causes across its entire life cycle. Welcome, Miyoko. Thank you. Before the pandemic, I was with my children on a pier, watching some fish, enjoying ourselves watching the fish, and a plastic bag blew into the water. And one of the fish swam right into it and being trapped in the bag, it started to swim faster and faster and down into the dark, deep blue. And it's really an image that my kids and I can't unsee. And it brings me to three of the dangers I wanted to talk about with plastics. First, plastics endanger wildlife. Like that fish, sea turtles, whales, and lots of other animals, they accidentally eat plastic and they get entangled in plastic. Half of the plastic that's used is used just once and then it's tossed and much of that ends up in our oceans. Scientists tell us that by 2050, the amount of plastics in the oceans 
are going to outweigh the fish in the sea. Second, plastics endanger health and environmental justice. It's in the air we breathe, it's in the water we drink, and it's in the food we eat. A study that was done in 2020, the scientists were sampling seafood and they found plastic in every single sample that they tested. But it's not just about eating plastic. Those petrochemical plants that are making the plastic, well, they're poisoning. They're poisoning black and brown communities and they're deepening environmental racism in our country. Third, plastics endanger our climate. Nearly every piece of plastic is made from fossil fuels. Now, there's a huge boom in fracked gas, and that is triggering a similar boom in plastics production. But these are plastics that we do not need. By 2050, the life cycle emissions of plastics is going to be 2.8 gigatons of carbon pollution. That's like building more than 600 coal-fired power plants and it's really going to deepen our climate crisis. But that doesn't have to be the path we take. And so plastic pollution is a very new problem, and it's a problem that we actually know how to fix. And it's not by recycling, only 9% of plastics gets recycled. But this bill shows us a path to require polluters to pay and also to stop making new plastic. Thank you. Thank you, Miyoko. Now let's hear more about how the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act addresses the plastic crisis systemically. Please allow me to introduce Jenny Romer. Jenny serves as the legal associate at the Surfrider Foundation's Plastic Pollution Initiative, and she will provide an overview of the proven policy solutions that make up this comprehensive bill. Thank you for inviting me to speak. The Surfrider Foundation is dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean, waves, and beaches for all people through a powerful activist network. The movement to reduce plastic pollution in the U.S. started with local grassroots campaigns to ban plastic bags 15 years ago, which became a gateway to banning other forms of plastic. We would not be here today in support of a comprehensive federal bill if we hadn't started with those campaigns. But we're not just talking about bags anymore. The Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act addresses the entire life cycle of plastics, from extraction and manufacture, to distribution and point of sale, to disposal and recycling. And the act is clear that plastics is an environmental as well as a humanitarian and environmental justice issue. One big goal is source reduction. Another big goal is defining recycling more strictly. So recycling isn't incineration or turning plastic into fuel. Recycling isn't shipping low value plastics to developing countries that don't have the infrastructure to handle it. A lot of that plastics en ends up getting burned or dumped into waterways and makes its way to the ocean. So not calling those things recycling sounds reasonable, right? Well, the plastics industry has spent millions of dollars for decades on trying to convince us that recycling is the answer and pushing these false solutions. They want us to believe that the problem is consumers not sorting their recyclables correctly. However, the truth is that we need to look not just at what's, at what's collected and sorted for recycling, but whether a manufacturer wants to buy it. And that's what this act does. Another big theme is a three-year pause on permits for plastic production facilities while the EPA updates regulations. There's a glut of cheap virgin plastic available, compromising the health of frontline and fenceline communities in the process. We need to stop this excess virgin plastic production at the source. And that's what the bill will do. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Now, to speak a bit more about advocacy work with impacted communities, I would like to introduce Mary Aguilera with Buckeye Environmental Network, who works in the front lines of plastic production, fighting to protect the communities in Ohio. Welcome, Mary. Across the United States, weak environmental protection laws allow industry to impact communities on the front lines directly and indirectly. By producing fracked plastic and turning the rust belt into the plastic belt in the Ohio River Valley, the petrochemical industry is allowed to create toxic water and air. Indirect harm 
includes un unaffordable water bills and housing, disproportionately infringing on the basic human rights of low-income people and communities of color. This is not a coincidence. We find those that are suffering from weak environmental protection laws are also suffering from high mass incarceration rates, non-living wages, unjust immigration laws, high illiteracy rates, and low health care coverage. These issues are all interconnected. Historically, indigenous people were the first to be violently evicted from their traditional homelands and negatively impacted for and by natural resource extraction. A legacy of colonization has led to the biodiverse and resource-rich lands of many indigenous communities damaged and decimated, including a lot of sacred land. Their rights are constantly under attack and they are left with no recourse. We must center our work on environmental and social justice to bring relief to our frontline communities and restore basic human rights. We need a just transition to protect the well-being and health of all of our communities. Thank you. Now, let's hear from Shashanda Kanbel, Youth and Engagement Coordinator at Youth Baltimore Community Land Trust, about why it's so critical to protect communities impacted by incineration. Hi, my name is Shashanda Campbell. I am with the South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Um, and a lot of the work that we do, I have been involved in environmental justice work since I was in high school. Um, I helped start a group called For Your Voice that um, had a proposal for the nation's largest incinerator to be built less than a mile away from our school. Um, and so we took on that proposal. And as community residents, we built power um, in our community to stand up against this infrastructure. And that incinerator wasn't built. It was a five-year fight. Um, and then we started to look at systems that is in place already around incinerators. We have an incinerator in Baltimore City, uh, the Bresco incinerator. And we have been doing a lot of work to stop um, incineration in our community and advancing um, zero waste. And a lot of the things that we see that's being burnt is plastics. Plastics are in everything. Plastics are in, our, in the stores, they are in um, our lungs, they're in our bodies. And that's because of the way they are being disposed of. They're being disposed of in, in, uh, in landfills, they're being disposed of in um, incinerators, and they're being disposed of in our waters and on land and in our trees, we see a lot of plastic bags. Um, and so this is really important to address this problem at the root and the root is stopping these single use plastics and plastics in general, because we do not need them. We do not need to be putting all of our natural resources into something um, that at the end is being burnt um, and harming residents. Um, we have say, I have lived in communities and like they like have been said multiple times, incinerators are usually in communities of color and low income and these communities are not okay. <laughs> These communities are aren't willing participants in this system, um, and this system did not ask us what we would want. And so we took matters back into our own hand, and we started to find ways like um, this to protect ourselves against incinerations, polluting, um, and the single-use plastic that's being polluted in our communities. Um, and so I am really admire everyone here today that is standing up against this crisis and doing something about it. Um, because if we don't now, we won't have a planet and we we need to stop the, making residents feel like they are disposable, um, no matter the color of their skin or the amount of money they have in their bank account. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Shashanda. Now, please allow us to share a short film that follows the damage caused by plastic at the point of production in Cancer Alley, Louisiana, to an incinerator in Baltimore, Maryland, to the impact of waste exports in Indonesia, featuring some of the many activists that are part of our movement to break free from plastic. Who benefits and who bears the burden of petrochemicals? We were never sick until the first plant came when I was in the eighth or the ninth grade. The majority of incinerators are in communities of color and low-income communities. Indonesia is a major dumping ground for U.S. waste. Plastic is killing us, and it's not killing us equally. Plastic disproportionately impacts black and brown and low-income communities. My neighbor on my right side died. The neighbor on my left side died. How many more have to die? Everybody has, to some extent, accepted it as normal. This is not normal. 
these legislative policies that would move us towards zero waste, that is a critical piece of the justice that we need. Give us back our life. Give us back our livelihood. Next, to keep us centered on how this issue is so critical to the health of our communities, I would like to welcome Imari Walker, who is an environmental engineering PhD candidate at Duke University and is investigating the occurrence and transformation of plastic additives within freshwater environments. Thank you. <clears throat> we are exponentially accumulating plastic in our lives and the environment. As this plastic ages, it breaks apart into smaller pieces called microplastics and can take hundreds of years to fully degrade. Microplastics come from the water bottles we drink out of, seafood we eat, clothes we wear, and the tires we drive on. These small pieces of plastic travel globally by wind and ocean currents and accumulate in remote places of our world, from the snow of Mount Everest, dust in national parks, and to sea spray in the Arctic. And unfortunately, recovery of these microplastics is a complex and almost nearly impossible task. For as we remove microplastics from our wastewater, <clears throat> uh, they are then reapplied as part of fertilizer for the food we grow. Microplastics are in our air, water, and soils. As an environmental engineering doctoral student, at Duke, it was during my studies that I learned the wide scale problem of plastic pollution. While I knew plastic could cause physical harm to marine life through entanglement and starvation, it was shocking to learn about the chemical harm posed by plastic. One of the greatest examples of environmental harm comes from tire additives that are killing salmon in the Pacific Northwest after storm events. And yet, we do not fully understand the health impacts of plastic products that we use daily. We do know that every plastic product you encounter has a unique combination of chemicals that is not standardized. And some of these chemicals are known to cause cancers and are reproductively toxic to the human body. We do know now that microplastics can be found in the human colon and the placenta of pregnant mothers. And thus, the knowledge that I have gained from researching the impact of microplastics on our environment comes with the responsibility to confront this global issue. My generation is being left behind with a warming world filled with plastic pollution, and we need action now. Thank you. Thank you, Imari. And to elaborate on the health impacts of plastic, I want to turn it over to Dr. Pete Myers, who is the founder and chief scientist of Environmental Health Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Myers. Good afternoon. My colleagues and I study how the chemicals in plastics impair health when they get into the human body and also into a myriad of other living organisms. It's just not pretty. The effects are different for different chemicals, but most plastics that have been studied demonstrate some form of toxicity, including even bio-based plastics. Given the shortness of time this afternoon, I'm going to list what some of the clear health impacts are. First, impaired fertility. My colleague Shauna Swan just published a whole book about this called Countdown. It's about decreases in fertility, and it's clear that chemicals from plastics are involved. Best established is reduced sperm count. Over the past five decades, Sperm count in Western men has declined over 50%. If that continues at its current pace, the median sperm count will be zero by 2045. Most men will need artificial help having babies. Other effects on males are well known, as are impacts on female fertility. Second, diabetes. Some very common chemicals that leach out of plastics alter how glucose is regulated in ways that increase the risk of diabetes. Third, neurodevelopmental challenges. Chemicals from plastics are linked to a range of neural problems, including ADHD and autism. 
I could go on for a long time, but I want to note two problems created by the rush to recycle ocean plastics. Recycle plastic used to build houses sounds like a noble goal, but it creates huge health risk because when those houses burn, they release multiple highly toxic gases and they will burn sooner or later. Second, roads built with recycled plastics may become the biggest source of micro and nanoplastics ever created. Roads abrade friction when they are used. The particles escape. Lastly, I want to add some good news. There is no scientific evidence that using reusable materials increases your risk of COVID compared to single-use plastics. So thank you very much, and let's get on with it. Thank you, Dr. Myers. And now I want to turn it over to Miriam Gordon, Policy Director at Upstream, who will talk about the importance of promoting reusable solutions. Thank you. Re reducing plastic is so important, but what kinds of products will replace it? Single-use products made from paper, aluminum, products made from harmful industrial agriculture, all single-use products we consume in a matter of minutes cause forever impacts to the planet. Reducing consumption of single-use products by replacing them with reusable and refillable formats not only minimizes the amount of waste that must be managed, it provides greater benefits for the environment, for business, and for our health. So at Upstream, where we work to make throwaway go away, we are delighted that the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act proposes the first ever U.S. federal policies to encourage producers to deliver the products we want without excess packaging, or in reusable formats. It requires producers to meet targets for packaging in reusable containers and enables the infrastructure for delivering beverages in refillable bottles. Reuse is a win by every environmental measure. Reducing disposables means cutting down fewer trees, leaving hydrocarbons in the ground, and creating less pollution, less litter, and less waste. Switching from disposable to reuse can lower greenhouse gas emissions by 85%. And reuse is also a win for the economy. It's estimated there, there are $10 billion in savings for businesses that switch to reusables, and many local programs are proving this to be true. Meanwhile, reuse will create new jobs in our communities where thousands can be employed in the collection, delivery, and cleaning of reusables. By allowing us to choose to reuse, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act will move us towards treating our people and the planet as indisposable. Thank you, Miriam. Let's take a closer look at the job opportunities that the sustainable industry creates, including reuse and refill systems. For that, let me introduce Ashley Orgain, Global Head of Advocacy and Sustainability at Seventh Generation. Ashley, could you help us understand how these types of solutions to the plastic pollution crisis create good paying jobs and stimulate our economy? Good afternoon, everyone. It would be an honor to share that with you all. Thank you for the leadership of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Coalition who has brought us here today. Plastic is an integral part of our fossil fuel economy. Moving away from fossil fuels and towards a cleaner, greener, plastic-free future will drive innovation and economic growth that creates good-paying jobs. Jobs in research and development of non-toxic materials, materials that are proven to be better for human and environmental health. Seventh generation is proof positive that a shift away from plastic is good for business. Consumers are increasingly looking for non-toxic, plastic-free alternatives for themselves their families, and the world. In fact, green is the only share of major categories that we operate in that is growing. And businesses that are taking action now in this space will be positioned to win in the future. We are honored to be here today and to support the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. It's encouraging to hear how these solutions create opportunities for businesses and communities which also benefits our youth. So I want to introduce Alex Gordon, Chair of Florida Perth Student at Ecker College. Alex 
help her college make a plastic-free campus commitment, and she's now scaling those efforts to her local community in St. Petersburg, Florida. Welcome, Alex. Thank you all so much for for inviting me to speak today and even more so thank you for making sure to incorporate the voices of young people into this work. Again, my name is Alex Gordon and I'm a junior at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm also the chair of our chapter of Florida Park Students on campus. We're a student run and mostly student funded nonprofit, part of a larger network called the Student Pergs, which is working on over 50 campuses to train the next generation of activists. I grew up in Houston, Texas, which is a place known as America's fossil fuel capital. When I was 10, I watched as the coast I grew up on was covered in 134 million gallons of crude oil flowing from the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. When I arrived at Eckerd, though, I had no idea I wanted to be an activist. I didn't even really know what that meant, but I did consider myself to be someone who was fiercely passionate about tackling climate change. So during my freshman year, I had the opportunity to launch a campaign to eliminate all unnecessary single-use plastics on campus by getting our school to sign on to the Break Free from Plastic pledge. They're building a local coalition of faculty, key administrators, and student leaders, and they're just educating our general campus population. We were successful and able to get this pledge signed in the fall of 2019. Now, my small campus of nearly 2,000 people is not going to reform the entire system, but what it can do and what it has done is show that it's possible. While Eckerd was doing this work, campuses, cities, and states across the country have also been taking action. In Connecticut, student activists with PERG are working to eliminate polystyrene foam after they successfully advocated for the banning of single-use plastic bags. In California, the entire University of California system is committed to phasing out single-use plastics. And just this Wednesday, the governor of Virginia has committed all state agencies and public campuses to phasing out non-essential single-use plastics by 2025. Back in Florida, after Eckerd's success, we're now working with a local city council member and other key community partners like Oceana to create citywide legislation that models the Eckerd Break Free from Plastic Pledge. It is young people and more generally students on college campuses that are educating thousands of our peers every day to advocate for the elimination of single-use plastic. And through winning the hearts and minds of our communities are paving the way for greater change on the city, state, and now on the national level. Campuses provide a successful model for change and show that solutions and policies like the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act really do work. Throughout history, students have always been at the forefront of movements for change, from civil rights to protecting our environment. The passions of young people have no bounds, and I cannot wait to see the work that we, as the next generation, will be able to accomplish. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Alex. Now to bring us back to the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act and how this bill can help protect the ocean, I want to introduce our final speaker, Jackie Savitz, Chief Policy Officer for North America at Oceana. Thanks so much and thanks to the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Coalition for pulling this all together. You've heard today about the impacts of plastics on our health, especially the health of frontline communities. You can see that plastic is helping to drive the climate crisis, and you know plastic is also killing our oceans. Two garbage trucks worth of plastic will get into our oceans in the time I'm gonna to speak to you in the next one minute. That's 33 billion pounds of plastics getting into our oceans every year. That's why whales are being found dead on the beach with plastics filling their bellies. That's why harbor seals with nursing pups are being found being strangled by plastics. That's why just about every sea turtle gut that anybody looks at is filled with plastics. These are endangered species. And these impacts are visible and they're unacceptable. But what's worse is they're symbolic of what we are doing to ourselves. Plastic is killing marine animals and it's also killing us. With production slated to quadruple, as you've heard today, the industry is on a tear. If we don't take immediate action to break their stride, all of these problems are only going to get worse. Today's beaches will actually look good in comparison with the beaches of 2050 if we don't act now. And don't believe the recycling promises you're hearing. 
you've heard today, recycling is not working. And we can't bank on it magically starting to work in the future just to get these companies off the hook. When the bathtub's overflowing, you don't run for the mop, right? First, you turn off the faucet. Recycling is the mop. The Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act is the way we turn off the faucet. So thank you to Senator Merkley and Representatives Lowenthal and Clark and Cohen for leading the charge to break free from plastic. But this is not going to be easy. We need all hands on deck if we're going to get this job done. We need all of you engaged and you can help. So let me turn it back over to Caro to find out how everyone can get involved. Thank you, Jackie, and I'm actually going to step in here, but um, once again, here are the ways in which you can support the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Ask your legislator to co-sponsor the bill, ask your organization to endorse it, engage with us on social media, and find all of these resources and more at breakfreefromplastic.org slash pollution dash act. To end us on an inspiring note, here are some of the many other movement voices working to break free from plastic. Why do we use something once and then throw it away? It's crazy. We need to break free from plastics because our future depends on it. People should break free from plastic because of the facilities like the one right behind me, where plastic production fuels toxic spewing into the air next to fence line and frontline communities. We must break free from plastic because it has wreaked havoc on BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color around the world for far too long. Forget about it. Turn off the tap. Stop single-use plastic now. We have to break free from plastic because recycling has been used as a marketing strategy for companies to make us believe that the climate crisis is our fault, when in reality, it's 100 corporations creating 71% of greenhouse gas emissions and most of them rely on mass production of single-use plastic. And I want my generation to live in a world free of the adverse effects of plastic pollution. We need to break free to stop using single-use plastics for the sake of the planet. For our sake, it really doesn't make sense now that we know. Before we close, we want to thank the more than 400 organizations across the country that have endorsed the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, and the many grassroots organizations that organized direct actions in the last week to bring attention to the bill. Thank you everyone for joining our rally to celebrate the reintroduction of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Please visit breakfreefromplastic.org pollution dash act to get involved. Thank you for your support and advocacy. Inside a mason jar, tossing a bag over your shoulder, back in your car. 